I am uh, Mikkel Mønsted from Ludus Dimicationis uh, and this is a brief introduction to techniques that you can use to improve your decisions uh, in the sparring, particularly these four techniques from the bind. And this bind um, happens as you are uh, advancing towards your opponent, keeping yourself safe. So we move forward and as we both try to win the center, um, this bind happens. So as you are trying to control the center uh, and your opponent as well is trying to control the center, you uh, may hold your sword and shield uh, together, uh, perhaps even biting into the edge with your uh, sword edge. And this makes this uh, enables you to uh, keep relatively safe while approaching your opponent. Whereas uh, if you stand like this and you drift too far to the left, your hand gets exposed. Um, and if you raise your sword, uh, you have a, a big opening in front here. So that means that keeping your uh, sword and shield in front of you uh, and moving from side to side, perhaps. Uh, in either case, uh, making sure that you have a, a guarding position with your sword and shield in front of you, this bind will happen. We're not actively chasing this bind. So it's not like uh, if, for instance, say Jens is standing off to the side with his, with his uh, sword and shield. So he has the same structure, but he's just off to the side. No, like this. Yeah. So he's just a little bit off center. Then there's no reason for me to be chasing this bind because he's exposed and that means that I can simply thrust at his face. I'm lowering the shield, not as a technique, but to demonstrate. So I might simply go for a straight shot because he's not covered. Uh, assuming he will cover, we end up here. And from here I can do uh, at least four things. So one of them is to thrust directly at the face. This thrust is made simply by inverting your grip and thrusting. Uh, normally the spine would be a little higher, so here. So from here, we cannot see each other's faces, but I, I know he's behind there. If he's wearing a helmet uh, and he's looking down, I might strike the top of his head, which means, which means I strike his helmet. Uh, he might see it and dodge it, uh, even though it's quite a fast move, so it's not certain that he could. Or I might miss altogether because uh, when they're thrusting here, I simply might just miss the target. So that means that, and, and the, the, the disadvantage is that in order for me to hit with that thrust, unless he's completely collapsed, I have to commit uh, pretty hard to the move because if we film it, if we look at it sideways, and we get to the bind. So uh, this high bind, I can't see really what I'm thrusting at, but uh, the, it's a long way. So I need to thrust all the way to my hilt almost in order to hit him. And that means I have to commit to that strike. Uh, so, uh, and that tactically means that as I'm committing to this, he might do something else if he's dodging the blow. This thrust uh, looks like this. So if you look at from the side, the bind is here, and I simply thrust here. Uh, and you should obviously only do a half thrust because you can't see where you're going. Uh, and that means that sometimes when you're doing this during sparring, there will be hits or maybe several hits of this kind that your uh, opponent simply does not see and you cannot tell whether you would have hit and that's just fine. Uh, if you see it, you might try to evade it and that uh, sort of simulates um, the situation that would probably happen in a real fight where the thrust would go further and you would try to dodge it and uh, so you can sort of play with that uh, mechanic. The second one is a uh, uh, low cut to the knee, particularly the, the tendons on the back of the knee, either on the inside or the outside. So, um, and this is uh, a good follow-up uh, to the thrust. If your opponent evades and if, he, if they just evade by uh, moving their head, so you find if I thrust, and then his 
leg is exposed, uh, and this cut happens uh, quite easily. I simply, if you uh, focus on my hand, come closer. So what I do from the bind here is I uh, drop the point. I'll just move this, uh, the, the shield. So I just drop the point and cut the tendons of the leg and pull back. So it's, it's quite simple. You just go. I would call those uh, direct attacks. So those do not involve uh, control first. The other two involves a uh, control move first. And one of them is uh, a bind and a shield strike of sorts to a bind to the left. And the other one is a bind to the right and a shield strike. So now this, now I am on the left side of Jens' sword. And as the swords are biting into the edges, I can rotate. I mean, these are not sharp, so, but the sharps would. Um, I can rotate around my, the axis of my uh, wrist and then at a certain point I can push down on the shield with my sword and strike above and then thrust at the face. Uh, that's the would call that a right overbind and a shield strike. So you rotate around the shield, and at a certain point, this is a, almost a two-handed grip on your sword, pushing his sword down. So at a certain point, he can no longer resist this, and you can feel that in the bind. And at that point, you can continue the, the push a little bit with your sword. So this frees up your shield, so you can shield strike, and as you shield strike, you straighten up, uh, kind of using the uh, the snake movement of your shield arm. So you sort of go, and then you attack. The overbind to the left um, looks like this. So now I rotate to the left, and as I rotate, I I punch forward with uh, the edge of my shield on his flat uh, and then strike. This is a combined movement and you use the rotation axis of your lower arm or hand and also this node. Um, uh, if you imagine that your sword would bite into the shield and this is kind of a rotationary node so if you rotate around the wrist first, like this, and at a certain point, you start rotating it around the sword instead. Unfortunately, I don't have a Viking uh, age sharp sword, so I'll just use this instead. It's still a sharp blade. Uh, this does not move. If I, I don't have to chop it in there, I simply have to push it a little bit against it. And that means that I, this rotation uh, is kind of locked. And that means that this gives me a nice two-handed grip against his sword in the bind. And as I rotate around the hand, his sword gets moved. And at a certain point, I then rotate around the bind here. A small revision, a very small revision to the overbind to the left and the shield strike. And that is placement of the sword on the shield edge. Because in testing this, we figured out that if you have your sword here, as you rotate to do the shield strike, you end up in pretty bad body mechanics to do a shield strike with this forward edge. So the position you need to be in is uh, with the sword behind the handle of the shield, because then as you rotate, you strike with this you strike with this strong part of the shield if i'm here in the previous version and i start to do the roll this means that my wrist gets bent in a weird way and i am trying to push the upper edge uh, the upper flat of pierce shield with a rather weak part of my shield but if i 
start my rotation from this. Instead, I actually attack the top of his shield with the top of my shield, which is the strong part. The change happens as we are in the bind, and I rotate my shield to get there, and then I do the overbind. This makes the overbind much, much stronger than before. I mean, you can even roll to this point, if you have the time, and do it with the stick. If you do it uh, pre-contact, so this means you advance towards your opponent like this, and then at the last moment you rotate forward, you can do it initially. I would still say that a good initial position is this, where you have contact here, because this way with the handle uh, going back, you have your elbow down, which means you conserve strength in your arm. And also, if you support the forward half of your shield with your sword, your opponent has a more difficult time of pushing you back with his shield edge. So if here now starts to push, I can at least feel it long enough to react to it. If you want to do the left overbind and you end up in a bind like this, you simply lift your sword and change sides. So just this way. If you pull it back, he can follow up with a thrust quite easily because you no longer support your upper edge with your blade. Okay, so I changed side and now I rotate around my hand and now I rotate again around my sword uh, node here. Strong. So that's the basic idea. You have these uh, four really, really basic uh, moves and this will improve sparring for uh, fencers because it gives you easier options. And one way it will work is if you are in a sparring situation or in a, uh, I would call it a simulated sparring situation, a exercise for sparring, you could try to work with these four moves and see how they fit together. One thing that's really cool is if in this situation, if Jens now resists my attempt to rotate him to this side to the to my right side uh, then i can if i feel that i can change and change my move to the other side and do the control to the other side because uh, if he's resisting that means that he's applying force in the opposite direction and the opposite direction is just the other overbind so that makes it even easier to do so let's say that jens is trying to do the uh, overbind to his uh, right and I'm resisting it if he changes the side and then moves it becomes easier for him and then you you can try that first and that means that you you have these really simple options to work with uh, and then you can put the thrust and the low cut in there as well because they fit really well together because if you um, if you simply add them, you get a more uh, complete system of attacks. So, now we collapse, I can cut his leg. So, as we are uh, attempting to train, that was a dirty trick because you were against the chairs. <laughs> um, as we are attempting to practice overbinding to the right and to the left, uh, at a certain point you might forget where you are if you are not uh, working well. And the one who realizes that can do the low cut because it's pretty obvious. Uh, let's say, let's do it again. Let's, if you are trying to do the overbinds and I'm just trying to not get caught in it, then you just push forward. Okay, so now he should realize that I have collapsed. So now he just cuts my low opening. Okay. Uh, that goes for the high opening as well, because if we are working here, and if I see that Jens is now collapsed because the distance is shorter, and I, can, I know that it's shorter because I can see his foot. So I definitely know that there's less space between us, and then I can do the thrust. And that might mean that 
if he leans back to get out of it, I cut low, and then um, I thrust high. So that now it becomes a system of uh, combinations, which means, which is pretty cool because you can then uh, cu quite systematically train these techniques, and it becomes much easier to string them together in a combination. So if we just come in here and I say push, boom. Or if we do it the other way, I try to aggressively push him towards the left, this one, and he resists that one, so I just do the other one. And uh, the last simple combo would be the one that we already showed, which is come here, just go here, go high. A thrust, a low cut, a bind, and a shield strike, and a bind, and a shield strike. That's it.